Huron was born in Dor Laman during the siege of Ongband. He had a younger brother named Huor. The brothers loved each other very much and were rarely separated. Huron also became friends with Burren of Dortonian. When Huron and Huor grew older, their father Galdor sent them to be raised by Halder, their mother's brother, in Brethil, as was the custom of the people. There the brothers were living when the terrible battle of Daedra Bragalak broke out and Hithlum was cut off from its allies by a sea of enemies. Three years later, orcs came down the Surion and attacked the Haldirians. Halder marched against them, and with his warriors fought Hurin, and with him Hur, who was only thirteen years old, but it was impossible to keep him at home. One day the scouting party in which the brothers fought was surrounded by orcs and defeated, and Hurin and Hur were pursued by their enemies all the way to Bridiac. There they would have been killed or captured if it had not been for the power of Ulmo, which was still in Surion. A mist rose from the river and hid the young men from their enemies. They managed to reach Dimbar and found themselves among the hills near the Chrysogram Mountains. There they wandered, not knowing how to return, until Thorinder, king of the eagles, saw them. He sent two eagles to help them, and they picked up the brothers and carried them to the secret city of Gondolin. Turgon, king of Gondolin, welcomed Hurin and Hur, for Olmo had long ago foretold him that help would come to him in his hour of need from the sons of the people of Kader. For almost a whole year the sons of Halder lived in Gondolin, and Turgon grew fond of them, especially of Hurin. He talked much with the young men and revealed to them some of his plans. All the people of Gondolin were also kind to the brothers, except for Maeglin alone, Turgon's nephew, who was jealous of the king's favor to Hurin and Hur, and disliked the men, believing them worthy to be only servants of the Eldar. But Hurin and Hur wished to return to their people and share with them all the weight and grief of this hard time. So they begged Turgon to let them go to their kin. Turgon did not want to do this. Not only because according to the law of Gondolin, no stranger could leave the city once he had entered it, but also because he loved the young men. But Huron said that human lives were too short to wait for the hidden people to leave the city. Besides, the brothers did not know the way to Gondolin by land anyway. They had come to the city by air, filled with fear and amazement, and their eyes were then covered with a merciful veil. Then Turgon agreed to let them go the way they had come, if Thorinder would carry them back. Maeglin, however, said that now the law was less harsh, and that before they would have had no choice but to remain in Gondolin for the rest of their lives. Huron replied that they would swear to tell no one the whereabouts of Gondolin or Turgon's plans. And so the brothers did. Then the king bade farewell to Huron and Hur, and the eagles carried them away by night, and brought them to Dorlaman before dawn. Their relatives were overjoyed at their return, for a year ago news came from Bredel that they were missing. The brothers kept silent about where they had been all this time, but Galder, their father, guessed from the rich clothes and neat appearance of his sons that they had not wandered in the wilderness, but had visited someone. And the eagles, and the fact that the young men did not want to say where they were pointed to Turgon and the secret city of Gondolin. Rumors of the strange disappearance and return of the sons of Galder, and speculation about where they had been, spread throughout Beleriand and reached the ears of Morgoth. Soon Morgoth attacked Hithlum once more. Galder fought valiantly on the walls of Barad Ithil and fell there. Huron had then barely entered the age of manhood, but he led the defense and proved himself a valiant and wise commander, strong in body and spirit. The orcs were driven back from the foothills of Aird Veteran with great losses, and Huron pursued them far to the north across the sands of Amphoglith. Thus, very young, Huron became ruler of the people of Kader and lord of Dorlamet. It was not long before some of the women and children of the people of Beer, who had fled the ravaged Dortonian, arrived in Hithlum. Among them was Morwen, daughter of Baragund. Huron and Morwen fell in love, and they married and settled in the manor of the ruler of Dorlumen in the southeast of the land, near the Aird Veteran Mountains. Morwen bore Huron a son, Turin, and a daughter, Erwin. 
But a few years later, disaster struck. The black pestilence broke out in Hithlum, coming, as they said, from the north from Ongband. Huron's children fell ill. Turin recovered, but his sister died. Huron grieved for his daughter very much and openly mourned for her and wanted to compose a lament song, but he could not. Then he broke his harp and left the house and shook his fist at the north, cursing Morgoth. At that time, Maedros was gathering an alliance of Eldar and Edain against Ongband. King Fingon joined him, and the men of Hithlum began to prepare for war. Huron was enthusiastic and had no doubt that the Eldar and Edain would win. Knowing his wife Morwen's reticence, he often spoke to her about the plans of the elven lords. Morwen did not fully share his confidence, however, for the wisdom of the elves had been passed down in her lineage, and she believed that the Eldar could not defeat one of the Aenor. And one day, shortly before leaving for war, Huron rose in the morning with a troubled soul and told his wife that if he was defeated, not to wait for him, but to leave with his son, for Hithlum was too close to Ongband. Huron suggested that they flee to Bretel, to his mother's kinsmen, but Morwen answered that the name cast a shadow over her heart and made her think of Doriath. Then Huron said that the name made him uneasy at heart, but then he laughed and said that they spoke of shadows from dreams, and if they won, their son Turin would be king of men, lord of Dorlamin and Ladros. And at the beginning of summer, Huron rode on his horse under a golden banner with his brother Huor and the warriors of the people of Cotter to battle. Fingon's army stood on the fortifications of the fortress of Barad Itel, waiting for Maedro's signal. Huron and Huor and their warriors stood on the right flank. Unexpectedly, before the battle began, Turgon came out of Gondolin with a large army to join Fingon's army. Fingon and his warriors rejoiced at the help. Morgoth's army approached Barad Idol, but Maedros had not yet given a sign, and Fingon did not attack the enemy, keeping the others from doing so. The enemy commander was ordered to challenge the elves to battle, and so he executed a prisoner, the elf Helmir of Nargothrond, to a horrible death before the walls. Helmer's brother Gwyndor could not stand it and dared to attack, followed by the whole of Fingon's host. The Nold onslaught was so fierce that they destroyed Morgoth's army before help arrived. And the army of the Eldar and Edain reached all the way to Ongband, and Morgoth trembled on his throne. But great were the forces of the Black Enemy, and his warriors were able to drive Fingon from his walls. Fingon's army retreated through the sands of Anfogleth, pursued by the enemy. On the second day, the orcs surrounded him, and the elves and Edain fought all night until dawn as the ring of siege tightened. But in the morning, Turgon's army came to their aid. Turgon cut his way to his brother, and joyous was the king's reunion with Huron, who fought beside Fingon. For a time, the encirclement was broken, and a retreat resumed. But before the elves could take refuge in the hills, they were attacked by the Balrog army of Gotmog, which was three times stronger. The orcs and Balrog divided the elven army, and Turgon, with Hurin and Huor, found themselves cut off from Fingon. The battle, afterward called Nernith Arnidiad, was lost. The remnants of Fingon and Turgon's defeated forces retreated southward along the gorge of Surion. Fingon was dead by then, but Turgon survived, as did many of the Gondolindrum. And then Huron suggested that Turgon withdraw to his city while the warriors of the people of Kata held back the enemy. For as long as Gondolin stood, Morgoth would be feared. But Turgon replied that it would not be long before Gondolin was hidden, and once revealed, it would fall. Huor then had foresight, and he told Turgon that if his city stood a little longer, then hope for the Eldar and Edain would come out of his house. Then Turgon agreed to leave, and Huron and Huor, together with his warriors, remained to protect his departure. Turgon managed to retreat to the hidden paths leading to Gondolin and disappeared without being seen by any of Morgoth's servants. Meanwhile, the brothers gathered the survivors around them and slowly marched south through Syrian's gorge until they were between the Serac domes and the River Rivel. And here they stood firm 
the narrowest point of the gorge. Like a black tide, the enemies rushed upon the stalwart human warriors, and like a rock, the defenders of Syrian's gorge stood firm. Morgatha's warriors flooded the stream with their bodies and surrounded the remnants of the Dorlaminians. And on the sixth day from the beginning of the battle, in the evening, all the warriors of the people of Qadr, except for Huron, were slain. Huor fell, struck in the eye by a poisoned arrow. This feat of men was considered the greatest of all their deeds in the service of the Eldar. Huron, on the other hand, fought alone for a long time. Throwing aside his shield, he struck with the two-handed axe of one of the Orak captains, and it smoked with the black blood of the trolls of Gothmog's retinue until it withered. And so, Huron killed seventy trolls with his axe. But in the end, Huron was taken alive at Morgoth's command and piled up a pile of bodies. Gothmog bound the man and, showering him with taunts, dragged him off to Ongband. The captured Huron was taken to Morgoth. He knew through his spies and sorcery that Huron had traveled to Gondolin and become a friend of his king and tried to intimidate Huron with his gaze at first. But Huron did not waver before the Lord of Ongband. Then they put Huron to slow torture, but that too accomplished nothing. Some time later Morgoth came to Huron and promised to release him or make him his supreme commander if he would reveal the whereabouts of Gondolin and the plans of its king. But Huron only laughed at the Lord of Ongband and refused to answer. Then Morgoth carried Huron by his own power to Huddindinjin, where the bodies of the warriors of the people of Kader were rotting, and threatened him again, asking him to think of his wife and children. Huron replied that Morgoth could not harm them from afar. Then Morgoth said that he was Melkor, Lord of Fates, and men would not escape him within the circles of the world, but that only nothing awaited them after death. He cursed the entire lineage of Huron, saying that everything his children had done would end in darkness and despair, and they would die cursing life and death. But even here Huron did not yield to his threats. Then Morgoth carried Huron to the top of Tangerondrum and put him in a stone chair, chained to it. Again he cursed Huron and all his kind, and made him watch his children suffer and perish. By means of sorcery, he made Huron see with his eyes and hear with his ears how the curse was being fulfilled, and that Huron could not die until it had finished its work. But no one heard Huron beg for death or mercy for himself or his children. For twenty-eight years Huron sat atop Thangordrim and saw everything that happened to his children, Turin and Nyenor. But the truth in his visions was mixed with lies, and everything good was hidden or distorted. And when Huron's children died, Morgoth freed him and gave him an escort of his warriors, pretending to pity his finally defeated enemy. But what Morgoth really wanted was for his curse to continue to work. Huron did not believe Morgoth's words. He knew that he knew no pity, and his release brought him no joy. Huron became an old man with long gray hair and beard and he left Ongban with a black staff in his hands and a sword at his belt. Morgoth's warriors accompanied him to the eastern limits of Hithlam, and then let Huron go wherever he wished. Huron traveled to Dorlamin, and the Vastax dared not touch the former ruler. They knew that he was accompanied by Morgoth's warriors on his journey through Amphoglith. But the people of the people of Kadar turned their backs on Huron, thinking that he had become a servant of Morgoth. Because of this, Huron traveled to Dimbar to Chrysogrim. Once there, where he and his brother were picked up by eagles, Huron approached Turgon, asking the king to let him back into the secret city. But Turgon, to whom the eagles had brought news of Huron's return, did not answer his request. He thought that Huron had become a servant of Morgoth. But the evil had already been done. Morgoth's spies were watching Huron and the Lord of Ongban knew where Gondolin was. Without waiting for an answer, and cursing in despair this merciless land, Huron fell asleep, and in his sleep he heard Morwen's voice calling to him, as if coming from Brethel. In the morning he set out for Brethel. At Teglin's crossing, he found a gravestone with the names of his children. Huron did not even look at the inscription, 
he knew too well what it said. And under the stone he saw an old woman, hunched and gray-haired, in tattered clothes, weary from hunger. She was much changed, but her eyes shone with the same luster that had earned her the nickname Eledwin, the elven beauty. That was Huron's wife Morwen, and Morwen recognized the husband for whom she had waited for years. But it was too late, for their children were dead, and she herself had foreseen that she would die at sunset. Only one thing did Morwen ask her husband. How had Nienor found Turin? Huron answered nothing, sat down beside her, and took her hand, and when the sun went down, she clenched his hand and died. In the morning, Huron buried her beside his son and carved the name of Morwen Eledwin on the stone under the names of Turin Turambar and Nyenor Ninyal. Then Huron, still haunted by the curse, turned south and traveled down the ancient road to Nargothrond. His son Turin had long lived there, and Huron had always admired Finrod Felagund. After Glorung's death, the caves were deserted, but then the little dwarf Mim sneaked in. He took possession of all the treasures and enjoyed them alone, as others feared the spirit of the dead dragon. Huron killed Mim, avenging his betrayal of Turin, and afterward took the only treasure from Nargothrond, the Necklace of Noblemere. Huron traveled to Doriath to meet King Thingol. The king greeted him courteously at Menegroth, recognizing Huron as an old man but he only remained silent in return. Then he threw Noglamir to the lords of Doriath with contempt, saying that it was payment for the way they had taken care of his family. He saw everything in a distorted light through Morgoth's eyes and thought that Thingol had wronged his wife and children. But Queen Melian lifted the veil from his mind and told Huron how things really were, and Huron realized the depth of grief that the curse had brought him. Huron raised Noglamir, and courteously gave it to Thingol as a gift, and he himself went out of Minigroth, and all who saw him retreated, not daring to look him in the face. No one knows exactly where Huron then went, but it is said that, deprived of all aspirations and desires, he reached the western coast and threw himself into the sea. Thus met his end one of the strongest heroes among mortal men.